everyone. It is 11 a.m. We're going to start this session. Welcome to Serving English Learners During Distance Learning, FAQs, and Provisional Identification Procedures. My name is Jennifer Norton, Manager of English Learner Support, and I'm joined by my colleague, Nika, are you there? Yes, good morning. This is Anika Harris, Professional Development Specialist, focusing on English language acquisition. And the third member of our team, Santiago Sanchez, is not here, but you see the three of us here pictured together at our uh, the Multilingual Learner Conference held last year. We will do introductions in a moment, um, and to get us started, our agenda for today is to go through five frequently asked questions, which we have published in a document from ASI, and we will walk through a provisional EL identification procedure and the ASI continuing continuous education principle. So for our meeting today, uh, we have a few agreements that we'd like to have in place. Um, the first one is to keep your mic on mute unless speaking to the group. So please do um, mute yourself, and then we will want to hear from you at points. Um, so we'll ask you to unmute yourself at that time. And we are here. We really appreciate your time. We hope you will stay engaged with us. Uh, speak your truth, ask questions, um, feel free to share, um, and as others share, please do assume positive intent, um, and let's support one another and be kind to one another along the way today. We are going to practice using a few of the features in WebEx. We just want to make sure everyone is oriented. So on um, your login, you should see your name and then the video button and the um, voice button here. So you will want to make sure that you are muted and this is where you'll press next to your name to unmute yourself. And then we also have participant control, so you can do a hand raise, uh, to say to agree, X to say no, speed up, slow down, and then um, some emojis as well. Um, everyone should have access to the chat box, so let's just practice using that and also do some introductions. So please introduce yourself, your school, and your role in the chat box. I'm seeing your chats coming in. I think everyone can see them. Good morning, Michelle, Christian, Denise, Elena, Angela, Jen, Rachel. Great to see everybody here today and appreciate you joining in. Hi, CQ, David, Melinda, Alicia, Amanda, Kayla. Great. So I know um, some of us know each other, some of us don't, but um, even though we're virtual, this is a chance for us to, to share uh, as we go. Uh, we will welcome your questions and comments. Um, we're going to do that through the chat box, and we will also have a couple of polls. So for our next um, slide, I'm going to ask if you will indulge me in a little practice um, using Poll Ev. So, one, I think 
The easiest way to do this, if you are joining from uh, your laptop, is to use your phone to text this number, 22333, to, and um, text Jennifer Nort 119 to this number, and that will allow you to join the full ev poll, or you can do it from your uh, web browser as well. And we'll do a quick warm up. I'm going to activate the poll. And we can see responses as they're coming in. And it may take you a moment to get there. If you're doing this, there may be uh, something that's asking you to get started and then click that you want to participate in a poll. And we'll see which dessert would you choose. We're coming up on lunchtime here, and we can just skip lunch and go straight to dessert. Um, would you choose ice cream sundae with all the fixings, chocolate cake, or on pie? Which, which dessert camp does everyone fall in? Looks like we've got a lot of people who want ice cream, maybe because that is for summer. Great. I'll give a couple minutes. Just want to make sure everyone's there and able to access full ebb because we are going to be using it. Um, again, in just a moment with a more um, work-oriented question. If you're not there, please do try to get the full app now. Okay. And I will keep going to the next question. Okay. So, we understand that this is a year like no other, and um, I was chatting with um, Ellie from Capital City at the beginning of the session saying, you know, kind of talking about how in many cases we have more questions than answers and feel like there's a lot being figured out. So well, to know you're not alone in this. Um, and yet you have a lot of things that you want to figure out. So just where are you? What is your main goal for the start of the school year? And I see one answer already. And please keep them coming. What is your main goal for the start of the school year? And this is anonymous. So um, please feel you can be open about that. Great. So I'm seeing answers. I just want to stay sane. This is so important for educators as well as all the students. Make sure we can support all students equitably. Effectively welcome students back to a safe and predictable environment regardless of label. Make sure all teams have all the information they need to get started with students. To make assessments less of a headache for schools, ensure teacher, student and teacher well-being, balance students' emotional needs and academic needs. It was wonderful to see um, all of these goals that will make such a difference for um, students and educators and families and having a start the school year be as smooth as possible, um, you know, regardless of, of the circumstances. So I just appreciate everyone's um, commitment to students and um, um, time and energy to, to achieve that. Okay. So um, we're going to dig into the concept for today, and the next section of the slides is based on a frequently asked questions document that was released um, by ASI recently. And you know, we acknowledge that LEAs and schools are operating in a rapidly changing environment under unprecedented circumstances um, that are lasting for unpredictable time frames. So we're committed to being flexible and accommodating where possible. Um, and so the, the, the guidance that's offered um, is aiming to provide clarity on questions and concerns that Ossie has received from LEA. Um, and this, these questions uh, aim to clarify um, responsibilities of states and uh, local education agencies to English learners and their parents um, during the upcoming school year. And this is, these are clarifications. This is not imposing additional requirements um, beyond those included in applicable federal and local laws and regulations. 
So we hope that these questions will be of use to you to share with um, staff, uh, school leaders, and um, to help clarify and confirm um, the support um, and um, services that would be ex that are expected um, for serving English learners. So there are five frequently asked questions that we will walk through and answer. Um, and hopefully you will walk away feeling uh, more clarity and feel prepared to share in case there is any confusion at your LEA surrounding any of these points. Okay, so the first question is, are LEAs required to provide language instruction and services to ELs during distance learning? Yes. The LEA must provide language instruction services to English learners during distance, in-person, and hybrid settings. The second part of the question is, if so, what are the expectations? See someone off mute if you can see yourself. So, um, physical school closures and social distancing schedules certainly may affect the way that services are provided, um, meaning that they could be done virtually, in person, um, a hybrid, um, and this we understand that this is the reality. Um, in this situation, and actually in regular <laughs> non-COVID times as well, um, we just can't emphasize enough how more than ever it is so important to have collaboration across English learner, general education, enrichment, special education teachers, really all school staff and parents to collaborate to continue to meet the needs of English learners. Um, if you have not already been collaborating, this is the time to start. Um, to help to um, prepare for the services and to implement them, uh, some strategies, there's three here, develop a plan for serving English learners, use multiple sources of data to develop proficiency goals, and then determine your EL program placement and services to support those goals. And we will have two um, upcoming sessions that will deal specifically on using uh, data and on um, describing um, English learner plans. Second question is, during distance learning, must, LEA, must the LEA provide English learners content area instruction and provide language accommodations to students in those classes? And the answer is, is yes. English learners must have equitable access to all educational programs. Um, and the LEA must provide language accommodations for content classes that are held remotely. Um, and if anything, technology provides numerous opportunities to provide those supports. If a student does not receive an access score due to suspended testing this spring, can the student exit from EL status? No. The LEA may not exit an EL from EL status without an access score that meets the minimum exit criteria. So we know that some students um, will have composite scores um, and some will not. But you do, the, the, the policy still applies that if an access score, composite score, that meets the minimum exit criteria must be achieved in order to exit. Um, for students who do uh, meet that criteria and exit, uh, we, Schools should really closely monitor these students to ensure they do not need additional support. So not only is there, you know, the summer summer slide that happens anyway, um, but given spring distance learning, we recognize that there may be some temporary regression and proficiency that may require more additional support. Um, so you want to keep that extra watch um, over students to help determine if they do need additional support. Okay. Um, and then for students without a composite access score, use all other available data to inform your English learner supports and services for the coming year. So this can mean domain level scores. This can mean formative assessment scores or other diagnostics you may give at the beginning of the year. 
This can include other assessments from the end of last year. And we will dig into that in our fourth, uh, fourth part of the EL Coordinator Summer Series um, on August 13th. The fourth question is how should LEAs ensure meaningful communication with parents of English learners in a language they can understand? And this is a reminder that LEAs must ensure that meaningful communication with parents of English learners in a language they can understand um, and notify parents with limited proficiency in English of information about any program, service, or activity that is also called to the attention of English proficient parents. Okay, so that's a reminder. Um, and then as far as strategies, we have um, several strategies and resources here, and you will receive access to the PowerPoint. So you can access these hyperlinks um, to resources. So one strategy would be to have families' preferred language of communication um, listed and at the ready in a tracker of sorts. Um, this can vary by school and LEA, but we have a sample here that can be used and or adapted um, to make it easy to provide information in a parent language efficiently. There are numerous um, communication and translation apps that are available, and we have resources that list the apps, different ways to use them, um, and that can help you when you are working with um, determining how to handle um, interpretation and translation. Similarly, there are numerous, like technology really does provide an opportunity to provide language access that can actually make things a lot easier. Um, we have some tips on working with an interpreter that you might find helpful. Um, okay, let me just pause for a second because I see a couple of questions in the chat. So I want to address them now before we go too far along. So when will access um, scores be available? And if a 2020 access score is not available, will we use 2019 scores for classification purposes? Okay, so um, access scores will be available in two ways. There was an ask to return um, material by two different dates. So if materials were returned by the first date, the scores will be available earlier. Um, and if the materials were returned for that student by the later date, then they'll be available a little bit later. And in terms of availability in the clicked app, scores will be available by the end of August and by the middle of September. And that's for availability in the click app, which I know is especially useful for when students uh, may be transferring across LEA. Okay. And then I can also forward the information that was sent out from the assessment division that details all of this. I know access, um, receiving access scores is a key question. And then there's a question that says, if a 2020 access score is not available, will we use 2019 scores for classification purposes? I.e., if a child received a score of 4.8 in 2019 but did not complete 2020 access, Will there be a level four ELL with a score of 4.8? Right, so you would just be using the most recent score, composite score that you have for that student. Okay, more information on different access from return to school. Okay, this is mandatory. There we go, um, it worked. Were you able to join it? Hello, we hear you. Okay, you put yourself on mute. Um, okay, I think I'll answer that question when we get to later in the session. Yes, you will receive this session. Um, okay, question about pre IPPs. Great, I'll talk about that when we get to pre K. 
And it says, will LEAs receive all scores at once, or will it depend on individual students? Some schools in UCS sent back materials earlier than others. Um, so yes, my understanding is that is um, by school, but I will have to check with um, Michael Craig and assessment uh, to confirm that. Okay. All right, let's keep going. But keep those questions coming, and the ones that I didn't answer now, I will answer later. And if I somehow forget, um, please do remind me so I don't forget. But... Okay, so this is going to address the question about screening. So if schools are operating fully or partially remotely, are LEA still required to screen new students to determine English learner status within 30 days of the first day of school um, and two weeks if enrolling after the beginning of the year? And will they use the same screener assessment during distance learning? So the answer that follows is going to be an overview and then we will pause, discuss, and I'll go into the details of the, the, the procedure that we have made available. So if possible, the LEA should conduct screening for English learner eligibility in person using one of the state um, approved English proficiency screeners and make every effort to do so in a timely manner. Um, however, if in-person screening is not possible, the LEA should conduct provisional EL screening, which then is described in the remainder of the presentation. So the provisional method is a very, it's a temporary provisional procedure, and it does not replace the requirement to conduct English learner identification using the state approved screener assessment once in screening first uh, in person screening is possible. And why are we doing this? We recognize that this is complicated um, and that you want to do your best to screen, but that there may be cases where it is not possible. And we want to make sure that you have flexibility on that timing and that students who are English learners are able to begin receiving the necessary English language supports and services without delay. Okay. Um, when using the, English, the provisional EL identification procedure, um, the parent notification that is normally done uh, through a letter, that can be explained orally um, to the parents um, at, at that moment. Um, so, and the so formal notification can occur after. For any student who is screened using the provisional method, the LEA must keep track of all the students and record their results as provisional EL or provisional not EL in your SIS. So these will be new values. As soon as it is possible to do so, the LEA should conduct full screening using the proper state approved screeners, and then provide the formal parent notification according to state policy. We won't get into the um, typical procedures for doing screening. We have that detailed um, on pages seven to 14 of our policies and procedures document. And on the EL policy and programs page, we have uh, training web webinars and numerous other um, tools to help you with that. And then we're always available separately if you have further questions. Um, today, we will focus on um, the provisional English learner um, identification procedure. Um, so I will go into that in detail to, uh, in the slides that follow. But before we do, um, just recognizing that LEAs are doing a lot of figuring out right now, um, we want to take a poll and get a sense of um, how are you doing with plans for English learner screening? Let me launch this poll. So how are you feeling right now? I'm ready. I'm planning for in-person socially distanced screening. I'm in the process of figuring it out. I have no idea. I <laughs> would love to learn from others. Um, I'm probably going to have to use the provisional procedure for at least some students. Okay, so I realize that um, people may be in different places. Just choose the answer that is best 
for you. Okay. All right, now we under can you please put yourself on mute. You just joined. Okay. All right, so it looks like that we have a lot of people in the process of figuring it out, ready to learn from others, and uh, many who see the, the potential need to do the provisional procedure for at least some students. Um, so at this point, I would love to hear more about where you are and anything you want to kind of share with one another um, as far as tentative plans. Like we're not holding anyone to this. This can be a space to talk about it. So please feel free to put in the chat box, where, what's your plan right now? What, what, are, what do you think is going to be happening as far as um, EL screening with your school or LEA? And then if anyone is willing to share, um, we can take off mute and have a uh, space for um, people to hear directly from you. I'll take a moment, pause while you um, share wh where you are with things, any tentative plans. And similarly, if you have questions for peers that you want to hear what other people are thinking, um, you can ask those questions as well. I see a note um, about the pre ICT remote option for um, pre K. And I have um, been previewing this assessment and um, I'm investigating uh, the use of that um, at this very moment. Okay, anyone else want to share questions, where they are? Okay, we're planning to use the provisional procedure until we know when students will be in the building. Okay. Okay. okay, so it seems like there will be some reliance on the provisional EL procedure. Okay, great. Let's keep going. Um, and again, we can hear more um, from others as we go. When will we know if we can definitely use the remote pre-IBT? Um, hopefully, we'll have an answer very soon. Should we use the provisional procedure or the virtual IPT if we have both options? That's a great question. Um, we'll, we'll say that, if possible, do the full screening. And if it's not possible, the provisional is available. Okay. So now I'll walk through um, in detail the procedure. And um, this matches with what is provided in the document. Um, a, a very you know, summary overview. Um, as usual for transfer students, you would review previous school records to determine if screening is even necessary. Um, and as usual, the home language survey results would be used to determine um, whether um, to conduct screening. And then step three, that's where we're going to go into a lot of detail. Um, and the procedure will be to conduct a virtual or phone interview. Um, uh, in lieu of the, um, in, in the absence of the ability to give the screener assessment. So this is not going to be an assessment, but more of an interview to gather information um, about the student. Um, following the interview, you'll make an, a provisional application and determine EL program placement, and then um, notify parents of the eligibility for EL services Notify the students' teachers of 
the identification and placement and begin email you know, services and then document the provisional identification. And um, step eight, I would say last but not least, is complete that formal screening for all students who were provisionally screened. And this is going to apply for pre-K through 12. Answer the question. Um, so now we'll go into more detail. This is fairly similar to what you would do typically. That if a student um, is a transfer student, you want to start with reviewing any previous um, school records that are available. So if a student arrives with an individualized education plan and needs to be screened, um, you'll want to determine appropriate accommodations and consult with a special education um, uh, staff person on interpreting the school. Um, and if a student is suspected of having a disability, but that is not something that's certain at the time um, of the provisional identification, um, complete the provisional screening with administrative considerations or accommodations that the EL and special education educators um, deem necessary. For within state transfers, um, as usual, go to the Early Access to English Learner Data Click app. Um, so you can find out there if a student um, has been previously identified as an English learner or um, in monitored status or has been previously screened or previous access scores, et cetera. Um, you can find out so much information um, about the, the, the students that can inform program placement. So if the student's records indicate that they're English learner, then no further screening is needed. Um, the school can use the previous data to determine ELL you know, program placement, notify the family of continuing ELL you know, services, and move forward. And then for, for students who are in pre-K or K, um, there are rescreening procedures um, on pages 8 to 10 of the policy document. If you want to refer to that on how to proceed. For out-of-state transfers, this is, again, this is not a new policy, but if a student has an access composite score from the past four years that meets the exit criteria, they scored 5.0 or higher, the student will not be classified as EL, so do not screen, mark as EL no, and submit an OST ticket to enter the student into the appropriate year of monitored status. If you have a student who has an access score that is lower than 5.0, um, they don't need to be rescreened. You would mark the student as EL yes, enter the access score in the EL status field, and no further screening as needed. Um, the school can then use the data to determine program placement and notify the family of continuing EL services. And for usual, if the home language survey indicates a language other than English spoken in the home uh, by the student, the student must be screened as possible. As soon as possible uh, for possible EL identification. So step three is to conduct the virtual or phone interview. For pre-K, this would consist of a family interview only. And for K through 12, there will be an interview with the student. For K, that is a speaking domain focus only. And for grades 1 through 12, it would cover an interview um, that addresses both speaking, reading, and writing. I have broken out grades 1, 2, 3, and 4 through 12 because there are rubrics um, for each of those grade bands when the interviewer or examiner is doing the rating of the students for the class. For the pre-K family interview, this should be done by someone who is an English learner professional. Um, and it should um, not, this is not intended to be a form that is mailed at home and completed independently. This is an interview that should be done um, by phone or by web meeting. And um, for usual, you would use an interpreter if necessary. And this is really important um, for helping to ensure meaningful communication with families. So they understand what this is about. And they can 
answer the questions and provide meaningful responses. Um, students, siblings, friends, or untrained staff should not be relied upon um, as interpreters um, as a reminder. Okay, I see a question about the rubric. So, um, where can we access the K-8 rubric for reading the students, speaking, reading, and writing interview? Um, so that link is on the OPI COVID resources page. And it was in the, the um, email that I sent out prior to the training. And I'll also make sure that it is in your uh, the email that we send out afterwards. And it walks through all of this and then has um, the um, Appendix A and Appendix B, which provide the forms that the interviewer will use um, to um, rate and report. No worries, questions are good. <laughs> and I'm doing my best to have as many answers as I can, and anything that I can't answer, please know that I'll take it back and figure out an answer and get back to it. Okay, so for the family interview, you do and ask the questions, which are asking about the student's exposure to and use of English um, and their home language that was recorded in the home language survey. And the student will be recorded as provisional English learner if the family interview responses about the student's exposure to and use of English indicate that English is used sometimes or never. And the student will most likely be eligible for EL services upon full screening. It will record as provisional, not EL, if the responses indicate that English is always or almost always used with family and caregivers, and the student will most likely not be eligible for EL services upon full screening. For K-12, there will be a student interview that includes um, speaking. Um, you know, as I go through this, you'll see that we're providing um, some uh, strategies and example questions and rubrics, um, but there will be a lot that's on the interviewer to have strategies in place to make this as successful as possible. So we will expect that the person conducting the interview is going to make sure that the student is comfortable, um, especially for those students who may, might not have experience interacting with someone through a screen. So you just wanna have strategies in place um, to be ready to make the student comfortable and to communicate with the parents so that they're ready to allow the student to answer the questions independently. Um, so for the speaking, the general flow will be to start with um, introductory beginning level questions, and these should be developmentally appropriate. Um, and then you'll ask probing follow-up questions um, with the goal of giving the student the opportunity to provide extended responses to give you enough evidence to, to make a rating. Um, and as you go, you want to ask increasingly higher level questions. So if the student shows that they can answer, you want to ask more linguistically demanding questions that will hopefully um, allow the student to, provide, to show you a more extended response um, of their um, repertoire in English. And you want to stop at the level where the student has difficulty responding um, because you want this to be a positive experience overall. And if the student has difficulty responding at a given level, you know, ask an easy closing question to end on a positive note. Um, and that's why we also are promoting um, the use of the probing follow-up questions so that um, you're giving the student the best chance to um, demonstrate their speaking ability in English. So here are some example questions. So you can see some kind of easier level questions at the top, um, intermediate level questions, and high higher level questions. Um, and then, you know, you can determine if you want to tweak these. These are just examples. Um, the probing follow-up questions are really critical for um, helping encourage a student to talk. So it really helps if you can say things like, tell me more. Can you say more about that? Um, why do you think that? What details can you ask, add to that um, to help, uh, help you get as much information as you can? So 
So there's a separate um, language use inventory rubric for each of the grade bands that's followed here. And I um, am just sharing uh, one of the grade bands from grades two and three, um, so you can see what it's like. Again, and this is part of why you want to have someone who's um, in English language acquisition um, you know, specialist or EL teacher at your school so that they're um, you know, prepared to um, interpret the student's responses in terms of their um, language proficiency. So if a student is providing only short phrases and simple sentences, that would get rated at the beginning level. If a student is presenting clear, expanded um, you know, responses that are you know, using very specific vocabulary that you would expect um, at that grade level, that would be high. And then if you see kind of something that's in the middle where you are having, there are some connected sentences, some short, simple sentences to talk in simple terms. There may be some content specific vocabulary, but it's not as, um, what you would um, expect at that grade level for a student who's not an English learner and you would choose intermediate. Okay? So this is just an example for one of the grades. Okay, I'm used to reading now. And this is for grades one through 12 only. So you would provide the student a passage or short book electronically in English that is both grade level appropriate and within range of the student's apparent proficiency, um, as shown in the speaking portion of the interview. And you know, it's recommended that you use a text from your curriculum, which is what a student would encounter you know, in the school year. Um, or, you know, something from, say, Zella or reading A to Z, along with accompanying questions that will help get at the student's um, comprehension of the text. And, you know, if based on the speaking, the student seems to be at the very beginning level um, of English, it's okay to choose a slightly easier reading passage, you know, assume that it's suitable for the grade level. Um, and, you know, that's okay. And then if a student showed um, that higher proficiency, it's okay to choose something that is of a corresponding grade. So you'll ask the student to read the passage out loud. And if the student can't read the passage at all, you can switch to an easier passage or end the reading portion of the interview um, at your discretion. Again, we want to you know make sure that this is um, positive for the student overall. Um, and ask two or three relevant comprehension questions. So here are some general, generic example questions to ask about what the student read, um, or you could use um, more specific questions that are relevant to the text. And there's a question about the protocol for documenting these screening results. Um, so what I'll do is, um, after I kind of go through, I'll pull up the PDF that shows the form for documenting. Um, it is Appendix A and B at the link um, for this procedure. But I'll show you the whole thing so you can take a look. Okay. For um, the rating of reading, this is pulled out from the um, for grades two, three, so you would choose beginning if the student was really only able to read, kind of comprehend the most simplest information in the text or show limited understanding um, of what they read. And I, for a student who was clearly able to read um, the text, um, you know, even if it was not on a familiar topic, and intermediate if there was, you know, the demonstration of some understanding of um, what was read um, with support and um, some, you know, use of grade level phonics and word analysis. For the writing section, um, if the student's reading was at intermediate or high levels, you would use a prompt related to the passage. But if the student was not able to complete the reading um, and was not able to show they understood it, then you can use a prompt that is not tied to the passage. So you can give the student a chance 
you know, to write about something that um, they might have success with. Um, it's okay to have written directions and a word bank, sentence starter may be provided. And then the student can either complete the writing in a meeting in front of you, you know, on, in, in the interview, or they can do it on their own and submit it by email. And then um, there is a rubric um, with three sections that I'll show you next. Um, but here are some example prompts. Write about your family, write a paragraph that tells you the passage is about, summary. Um, so these are generic, um, which you can customize um, if you if you will. So for writing, you would um, choose one rating for each of the areas of cohesion, word phrase accuracy, and sentence accuracy. After you go through that interview process, you will make a provisional identification. So this is the decision point is either provisional EL, provisional not EL, and then from there determine um, EL program placement. I've already described uh, the, the criteria for pre-K, for K through 12, if any of the rubric ratings are beginning or intermediate. Uh, indicating the student will most likely meet the criteria for EL status upon full screening, then the student would be rated as provisional EL. And then if all readings are high, indicating that the student will most likely, um, sorry, they should say meet the criteria for not EL status upon full screening, then they would be reported as not EL. I'll, I'll correct that before we send that out. So you'll use this determination to then um, make a program placement decision. And it's really important to keep track of assess all the students who are screened provisionally. So whether the student was provisional EL or provisional not EL, all of the, those students need to be screened according to the full procedure as soon as possible. And um, I am reiterating that in the bullets because it is so important. Just because a student was not EL in the provisional doesn't mean they don't need to have the screener test afterwards. They still should get the screener. And same thing, if you were provisional EL, you still get the full screener. Um, you know, and this is important not only because that is uh, for, you know, must be done, um, but also because that's going to give you a proficiency score. Um, to use to understand where the student is in more detail. Um, you can, of course, use the information from this provisional procedure to help you make that program placement determination, but this is just the first step of getting to know what the student can do. Um, if a student is unable to complete the interview process um, for some reason, such as disability or a refusal, um, Provisional EL status would have to be determined based on academic records review. And then if reasonable evidence of English proficiency cannot be established based on those sources, along with the incomplete screener results, um, then the student should be provisional EL and full screening can be completed. In distance learning, you know, as we have stated, the language needs of English learners must be met. And if a student has an IEP, then English learner and special education personnel must collaborate to determine appropriate um, program and placement. Um, and okay. Jennifer, this is Anika uh, just jumping in. Oh, thank you. Um, there is a question uh, or a point of clarification, rather. Uh, that came in a bit ago about the pre-IPT. So okay. this is relating to students uh, in pre-K3, pre-K4, um, those early years. And the question is, if it's determined that we can use the pre-IPT remote version, will we have a choice between the interview or the remote screener? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a great question. And so I will not have an answer for that now. Um, I will have an answer when I have an answer for whether we can use a free ICT remote. So that is a hold on and we'll have an answer. But an important question that I appreciate and we make sure that we address. 
Thank you, Anika, for the pause. All right, so um, step five would be to notify the parents of eligibility for EL services. Um, again, we will not go into the details on the usual procedure. We have that outlined in pages 13 and 14 of the process and procedures document, and we also have sample parent notification templates that you can use to customize your letter. Um, but when you're using this procedure, because you have not you have not completed full English learner identification, you can explain this to parents orally, um, and then you can provide the parent notification um, letter after, um, once you have the full, full screening completed. So please do make sure that you um, notify the students, teachers of their provisional EL identification and, and begin those EL supports. That is why we have this procedure in place so that you, know, you can have that flexibility of the timing because this is such a challenging and uncertain time that makes scheduling really, really hard. Um, but we don't want students who really will, will benefit from EL supports to have any delay in, in receiving those supports. So please do communicate with the teachers um, and begin those EL supports right away. And um, I have a note here that says students must have formal English learner status in order to take access to annual summative um, English proficiency tests. And I think that there was a question earlier um, about that. So if, if, if at this point, my understanding is that access can only be given in person. So if there are plans in place for people to take access in person, that EL screening in person must take, must be done immediately. Um, that should be done before the student takes access because they're not considered uh, uh, English learner and fully until that screening is completed. I hope that clarifies the question. But if there are any other questions about that at this point, um, just let me know. So for documentation, um, you know, you would file the home language survey and the documentation according to your LEA security procedures and uh, um, the EL indicator field, which is yes or no, must match the provisional status of provisional EL or provisional not EL. So you want to record this in your, your SIP. Okay, so these are new values, the CEL and PNEL. You're going to leave screener score and screener date, screener date blank until after the formal, formal screening is completed. And these are new fields, actually, this year, which we are really glad to um, have available now. Okay, so just to confirm, provisional EL status is not formal EL status, correct? Provisional is provisional. It is not a full, formal, or complete, completed EL identification. Okay. So um, again, just complete that formal screening as soon as possible um, and try to plan ahead for it. So if possible, complete full screening. If you cannot, do the provisional and then figure out a plan for how you are going to get the full screening completed. Okay. Um, when you have completed the full screening, you're going to update the fields in your LEA SIS as soon as possible. So that EL indicator of yes or no must be updated based on the full identification process and the EL status should not be kept as PEL or PNEL. It should be updated um, to reflect the screener status. Right? And there's a long list of value options there depending on which screener. Um, and yes, we'll have the recording available and posted. And um, we're also available if there's questions. I understand this is a lot and it's new um, and it's provisional. So <laughs> um, definitely reach out if you have questions. Um, so the absolute latest that Aki is saying this can be completed is March 1st. 
upon return to school, resolve these provisional statuses within 10 days. Supplemental ELUPSFS funds will be provided for students with provisional EL status as of the enrollment audit. Okay, so you want to have this provisional status in the SIS and you want to resolve it <laughs> uh, as soon as possible. Um, but please know that this is um, part of the process. Um, yeah, so this is a question about what is what does 10 days mean? So I'm going to say 10, 10, 10 days, two weeks, basically. And um, the April LEA quarterly payments will include reconciliation for resolve of provisional statuses based on the EL statuses as of March 1st. So if there are students with unreconciled provisional EL staff after March 1st, then the LEA will return those funds. Also, if a student is provisional and then withdraws after audit without completing formal screening, and if a student um, was designated initially provisional, yes, and then after full identification was not EL as a result of full screening. Those would be the circumstances um, in, under which the LEA would return the supplemental EL UPSFS funds. So I have a question, what if schools are not in person by March 1st? Is this a moving target based on COVID? So I guess I have to say this is this is the procedure with all of the information that we have at this moment. Um, and I can't predict what will happen um, in, in, in the near future. Um, so, but this is where, what, this is the policy um, now. And then um, I did want to point out the last point. If it is not possible to conduct full EL identification for a student by March 1st due to special circumstances, the LEA should submit documentation to OPSI by February 15th um, to provide evidence that EL services are being provided um, and make why the screening cannot be completed. And that would be submitted through the OSG. Any questions you want to ask at this time? All right. Hi, Jennifer. It's Anika again. Hi. There are a couple of questions uh, that came up initially, and um, let's see if I can find them. Uh, one is from uh, Dominique about access data. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, if the second wave of access data isn't available until mid-September, should an LEA screen a student that was received by a different LEA? or wait until after scores are available. But I think, to understand, make sure I understand the question, but I think if the student is English learner and actually available in, um, in the early access app, mm -hmm. so that the, the status of the student is already taking access, mm -hmm. and they've already been identified as English learner. Yeah, and answer the question. Uh, that's right. From looking um, at it, I would also uh, refer to um, the EL Click app um, to try and get that information <clears throat> uh, if the student is transferring from another DC LEA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So if we don't have access for, should we screen to create goals? No, please do not do that. Screening is only for initial identification. So once the student is English learner, that is their status. Um, if you don't have their access scores, um, we're going to ask you to kind of use other sources of data. And we have a session dedicated to that on August 13th. 
And I realized that that's kind of a, a, a tricky situation for everyone trying to figure out well, what data might be meaningful. What if the data are, are from last spring? Are they still valid? And these are all kind of pieces to a, to a puzzle that everyone's trying to figure out. But, but no, we don't recommend any kind of re-screening. That's for initial identification only. Okay, so let me, I'm on the OSI page right now. Before we go on, I wanna make sure everyone can um, see the actual procedure and what it looks like. So there's a section here for serving English learners. These are the resources that we've published related to um, COVID so far. And this is the provisional procedure. I just need to take a second to load, hopefully. Okay, here's a question. Should we predict that screening cannot be completed by March 1st since we are asked to provide evidence that EL services are being provided by February 15th? Um, I'm not totally sure I understand the question. Um, I think we're, I think what we're trying to say is that the norm should be that EL screening can be completed. Um, but if there is a special circumstance where it is impossible um, to send that to OSI through the OST ticket by October, I hope that answers the question. But if not, please ask a follow up. And for Kate. English learners that were identified in pre K, do you have a recommended screener so we can have current a current idea of their language abilities, assuming they were initially identified in pre K three? Okay, so that's a student who's already English learner and has taken both the two domain and um or has taken the two domain and or maybe the four domain. So we have another screener. So I think if the student's already an English learner status, a screener is not what we are looking for because you're no longer screening for EL status. But I think you're saying, what can I use to have um, an idea of the student's abilities in English at this very moment? Um, so again, what we're going to be talking about um, on the 13th will be what are sources of, of data that you might already have available. And then um, in addition, ways to use um, WIDA, the WIDA framework and the WIDA rubrics to gather um, information about student language proficiency um, in an ongoing way. question. My recording, but that's okay. I've got questions to answer. What about students that were proficient in QSA on the ICP, but should be rescreened on all four domains at the beginning of first grade? So I think that initial screening, uh, the the four domain screening, um, yep, that should occur if possible. And then, um, you know, if it cannot be. You want to do the provisional and then finish that screening um, as soon as possible. Okay, yep, and it's an ongoing issue when you try to create K groups based on English proficiency without current language data. Yep, it is. And we'll have to find ways to gather data on student um, language proficiency um, in a way that's ongoing and is kind of feasible um, given. The instructional okay, so let me scroll down here. I want to show you the form. Um, okay, so Appendix A is for the family interview. You can see this is a form to fill out. You know, you can make any way to either fill this out on paper or electronically and answer these questions about the student's um, language use and then make a decision. 
And then for the language use rubrics, you would um, see here you can kind of fill, fill this out. And for K, there is just speaking. And for um, grades one through 12, there's going to be two pages. There's speaking, reading. And then um, the second page has writing, and then you make the determination. Um, I have a question here. Is there a reason why Alpha did not recommend LEAs to use the WIDA remote screener option? And yes, this is a very good question. We have reviewed this. And um, upon review, uh, one reason that uh, we do not, do not recommend this, and this is not part of the provisional, Procedure is because there is a need to provide um, paper material to each student individually. So um, it's not something that can be done only through video. It would require getting paper materials to the students and then getting, um, actually, I don't think the paper material has to come back, um, but it, it just seems logistically to create um, a burden that we wanted to avoid because we understand that part of the issue is getting the, getting in person period and um, also just to minimize like shuffling materials back and forth. So that's that's part of it. Um, so we hope that what we're presenting today, um, you know, is going to be useful and feasible for for everyone. Okay. All right. Let me go back to sharing the PowerPoint. Um, and I want to talk about briefly the continuous education guiding principles and LEA plan. So OSI has released guiding principles for continuous education. They're organized into three pillars, high expectations, equity and access, and family engagement. And the purpose of these principles is to provide LEAs and families with clear and consistent expectations for the continuous education that will take place during the school year. Um, to help LEAs develop effective and equitable continuous education plans that strive to meet the needs of all students and are developed in partnership with families, and to support families in understanding what they can expect for their students and the two-way communication um, that schools should establish with them. Um, and ultimately, this is offering a target for excellence rather than a floor for compliance. Right, and I'm going to focus only on the section on English learners today, which has four key points. And um, the basic premise of these is that the English learners retain all of their um, rights consistent with the law and should have their unique instructional and language needs met. Um, so first is to that LEA should plan within the first two weeks of the school year to um, communicate with families how they will shift resources, policies, and practices to identify and support English learners across remote and in-person learning environments, um, while of course complying with, um, you know, federal civil rights and education law and state policy. And um, LEA should prepare to identify English learners in a timely manner, including rescreening for all students who are provisionally screened while in a remote learning environment. So if please try to plan for that, um, the, both the in-person screening, the provisional, and then any um, full screening that must occur afterwards. And um, in these principles, LEAs should implement their EL programs with fidelity across both remote and in-person learning environments to advance the linguistic and academic goals of English learners and have a system in place that draws on multiple data sources to evaluate and refine their EL program. And finally, to communicate with families in a language they can understand to the extent possible um, in compliance with Title I and the Language Access Act. Okay. Um, the session that we are, we have three sessions coming up, um, which will um, address these to help provide you support and a place to um, kind of work through a lot of these um, plans together. So, um, 
in addition to the continuous education principles, but in alignment and in alignment with them, um, LEAs are um, filling out recovery plan applications. And I wanted to point out the section on English learners that um, is asking that LEAs describe their plan, including description of their model, how it will maintain fidelity across in-person, distance, and hybrid learning environments, um, how the LEA will set goals across the four domains of reading, writing, listening, and speaking, and how instruction will be provided across those domains, and how the LEA will provide the students access to academic content by grade and proficiency level. Um, so our session um, three, which is on um, August 5th, will um, focus on providing a space for discussing and outlining what does it mean to um, have fidelity of your program model across these different environments. Um, we'll have um, the opportunity for people to work in groups and um, you know, puzzle through a lot of these things and figure out what does it mean to describe this. And we understand that you're you know, grappling with this and working on this right now. Um, so we're designing that session to, to be of service um, to you in that. Okay, I'll pause again and make sure we cover any questions. Okay. And just want to plug again the sessions that we have coming up. We'll send a link to register for these in the um, email that follows. And um, in the PowerPoint that you receive, you will um, have a link to all of these resources um, that are available for you. And again, um, you can reach out to us with questions. Um, there is, a, we have a new system for registering for our training. So they can all be found at this one link. And if you're not already subscribed to the monthly bulletin, we encourage you to we encourage you to um, subscribe to that okay so this will conclude the end of our session unless there are any questions so i'll stay on if there are questions please do ask them um, otherwise we are at the end of our time Great. Well, I see no quick questions. I thank everyone for joining, being part of this, for all your good questions. Um, yes, we will share the slides, and um, we will be we will be in touch. Thank you all. Okay, Angela, I see you have some questions. We'll um, look at those in a moment.